Good evening and welcome to this special event with the Institute for Islamic, Christian and Jewish Studies and the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra. I'm John Rivera, the Communications and Marketing Director of ICGS. Our mission is to dismantle religious bias and bigotry by building learning communities where religious difference becomes a powerful force for good. We offer fellowships, courses, and online events like this one tonight with the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra's artistic advisor, James Conlon. Mr. Conlon will share with us his Recovered Voices project, which has been his mission of the past three decades of seeking out composers who were repressed and silenced by the Nazi regime and reintroducing them to the public by performing their works. With its racist ideology and systematic suppression, the Third Reich silenced two generations of composers, most of them Jewish, and with them an entire musical heritage. In addition to his position with the BSO, Mr. Conlon is music director of the Los Angeles Opera. And as an LA boy, I have personal uh, privilege to say, go LA. Uh, he has also served as principal conductor of the RAI uh, National Symphony Orchestra in Torino, Italy principal conductor of the Paris Opera, general music director of the city of Cologne, Germany, and the music director of the Rotterdam Philharmonic. For his work with Recovered Voices, Mr. Conlon has received several honors, including the Roger E. Joseph Prize at Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion and the Crystal Globe Award from the Anti-Defamation League. So please join me in welcoming uh, with James Conlon. Thank you very much, uh, John. I'm very honored to be able to speak with all of you today. Um, for a little time, an hour is very brief. The subject is enormous. Um, and yes, it's been part of my mission in life in the last 30 years to uh, bring to the attention to the general public, classical music lovers, but also people who don't know or follow classical music as keenly as I do, perhaps, um, with the, um, with the uh, facts that a large number of compositions have uh, existed underneath the radar, relatively neglected. I don't say they've all been all neglected all of the time, but taken all together. Too many have not been given the due that they were, that they deserved and deserved. Uh, the, I, try, I have tried to address this just through personal efforts, um, the creation of a, uh, of a website, which I will show you later. And uh, of course, as performing it as often and as and as well as is humanly possible in as many places as I can and trying to inspire others to follow my lead in this. And why is that? Because uh, we have uh, all suffered a loss, even those of us who were not living at the time. Something has been taken out of our inheritance, our patrimony that we should have been able to enjoy, to, uh, to, with which to be enriched uh, through classical music by composers who were suppressed under the Nazi regime. Uh, many were suppressed personally. Uh, some, many were forced to go silent. Many were forced to emigrate. Many, the least fortunate of all, uh, were uh, murdered in concentration camps. The common thread that goes through through the story with all of them is that their music was not played after approximately 1933 and fell off the uh, radar, as it were, after the war, and for very complicated reasons, which I will go into a little bit later, um, were not to be heard from after the war as well, those, even those who had survived. Um, this is a large subject. Uh, 
But what I can tell you that the good news about all this subject is that most of the music is actually is published, it exists, can be heard um, in live concert when it is performed live on YouTube, through CDs, through all of the, uh, the recordings that you know, are commonly available. Uh, the good news is that there is a revival. When I started 30 years ago, I had some very brave and courageous predecessors, but uh, in many cases, um, their work uh, did not uh, uh, develop traction enough for it to be commonplace. So I, I applied myself in, uh, in the early 90s. I found that um, I'm happy to say that now there are many people taking active roles. We call this we, I say, I should say that. There is a term, I use it, and my associates use it, it's recovered voices. This is a term that was coined by the Los Angeles Opera when I first came to Los Angeles in 1906 um, to designate works that had been covered or missing or at least neglected, and they were being uh, now uncovered, recovered, and performed. Uh, I have an association with the Colburn Conservatory in Los Angeles, um, uh, one of the fastest, if not the fastest growing new conservatory in the United States uh, that has called, it's given, has given us, taken that title, Recovered Voices. It is also known as the uh, Tiering Conlon Initiative for Recovered Voices. Uh, that is thanks to our uh, greatest donor and sponsor to whom we are great, greatly indebted, Marilyn Searing. Now, uh, where does my story start? I'm going to start with a little bit of music. I want to do this, and I may fade it out shortly. Um, and I'm here with my associate, Jennifer, who's going to put it on for you. No, that's Gustav Mahler. That's piano. That was just to entertain you while you were waiting. Right, and you can't see it. I don't know why it didn't come over here. Okay. There we are. Okay, so we're going to put this on for you, and we'll keep the volume low so I can talk over it for a moment. Uh, this is the piece where my personal story begins. And uh, let's see if it comes up and it works. Um, and it all started on a cold, rainy night in the city of Cologne, Germany, where I was general music director uh, of the symphony and the opera for 13 years. Um, I switched on my radio and heard this beautiful, exquisite piece, did not know what it was. And um, I must confess, I sat in front of my door and polluted the atmosphere until I knew what it was. And it turned out to be a piece called Die Seejungfrau, which in German means the mermaid. And it is based on Hans Christian Andersen's uh, famous story. And the composer was Alexander Zemlinsky. When the announcement came on, I knew that this piece somehow would become a part of my life. I did not know it would lead me into this entire subject and to this mission. Now, let's see, let's see Jennifer, if we can get that to play a little bit. This is just to give you a taste. And I did conduct this on my first concert in Baltimore with the Baltimore Symphony last September.
So if you can hear me well now, that just gives you a small uh, a small idea of how beautiful uh, these some hundreds, if not thousands, of pieces that have been lost can be. So what is recovered voices and uh, which composers are involved? Um, let me start from the outside uh, out, from the outset to say what it is not. And I'm often asked the question, uh, is this about music written in concentration camps? The answer to that is no. There are pieces that were written in concentration camps. There are a small number of them that have uh, survived. They perhaps make up between one and 2% of the music uh, to which I'm referring. Um, the story and history of every composer that I put into this group is different. Uh, they are not necessarily related. Some were colleagues, some knew each other, uh, some didn't. Some liked each other, some didn't like each other. It's like any other group of artists and composers, they were also competitors. So uh, this is not a monolithic group. Uh, their stories are different, their histories are different. And part of the fascination with the subject is that it reveals to us the great uh, variety of what were uh, of what was existing uh, particularly between the world wars and some of the way into the second world war uh, it's a uh, it's a very rich and large subject and I want to show you a few pictures to now what's your appetite for the times and I will explain the pictures as we go let's get that first one up there is a man you will all know his name is Gustav Mahler Let's see if he comes up now. Okay, there he is. Now, Gustav Mahler uh, is, was the potentate of Vienna and Austrian music in the first, set, first decade of the last century. Um, he was Jewish. His music was banned by the Nazis, but he was already so famous that his name and reputation could not be destroyed by them. And so we all know him. So I don't usually speak of him as a recovered voice because he had no need of recovering. But not all, all composers were as lucky as Gustav Mahler. So he is there as a major figure in the lives of some of these other composers. So let's move on to the next slide if we can. And this is Franz Schreker. Now we're going to talk about Franz Schreker, who was who was educated in Vienna uh, at, at the uh, late in the 19th century, and we are going to feature a few of his pieces. You will have heard uh, one of them perhaps recently in a subscription concert. We're going to play you a short excerpt. Uh, when we get to our next musical excerpt, and we're going to uh, advertise, I guess, to say that when I return at the beginning of next season to the Baltimore Symphony, I will put a major piece of his on the first program. Uh, so that's Ron Schrager. Let's remember him, and we'll come back to him shortly. Now, the next one is Alexander Zemlinsky, who is the composer of the Mermaid, Die Seejungfrau, of which you heard a short excerpt, and we may have heard uh, our subscription concert that opened the season uh, uh, at the beginning of last September, October. Uh, Alexander Zemlinski, in my mind, is maybe, at least he's my favorite, but uh, he, I think he is the greatest of these composers who has suffered this fate. Uh, he was, he, as many artists were, he was highly respected, but still having a hard time getting a lot of his music performed. Uh, he was the uh, uh, he was a he was a, uh, an assistant and close to uh, to Gustav Mahler. He was the brother-in-law of the uh, of the famous and here he is next composer Arnold Schoenberg. You will have heard of Arnold Schoenberg. Um, they uh, were brothers-in-law. Zemlinski's sister was uh, Schoenberg's first wife. Arnold Schoenberg is famous. Um, if everybody doesn't love his music. Um, that is, of course, understandable. I don't include him usually in my talks about recovered voices because he survived. He came to the United States. He uh, has made his mark on history and is not, uh, is not therefore, forgotten. 
But he was in the same group of composers who were specifically outlawed and banned by the Nazis and who were listed and presented to the public as uh, degenerate composers. They wrote, in the Nazis' words, degenerate, that's Antarctica in, Ju in, in, in uh, German, Antarctica Musik, degenerate music. I don't like to use this term because it's the Nazis' term, not ours. And it was it was used to denote just about anything that they disapproved of. The majority of those composers were Jewish, not all of them. They also persecuted people who they didn't, whose political views they didn't like. They were against jazz. They were against anything American that included black musicians. They disliked the saxophone. Uh, so it was a grab bag sort of. Uh, uh, term that they used to generate music, but it uh, survived. There is Antarctica to Musik, which is degenerate music, and Antarctica to Kunst, which is degenerate art. Uh, we will refer to them. Now, these three composers, uh, Schraker, relatively neglected, Semlinski, relatively neglected, Arnold Schoenberg, not neglected at all, uh, all knew each other, all were closely associated, all were Jewish and all were persecuted and suppressed by the Nazis. What was the big challenge that they were feeling long before the Nazis were ever heard of in music? And their challenge was to uh, bring and make a synthesis of two antithetical composers uh, who had both created a school of thought and composition in the at the end of the 1800s. And they are, first of all, Richard Wagner, loved and hated, admired and detested, uh, but uh, impossible to be ignored. Richard Wagner was, uh, who created a type of art and music and his followers, the Wagnerites, uh, passionately defended that view. Then there was the view of those followers of Johannes Brahms, who's our next fan. There's Johannes Brahms. And they were antagonists, the Brahmsites, the Wagnerites, particularly in Vienna, which was, of course, in, in its way, the center of the musical uh, universe at the time, or the classical music universe. And so the young Schoenberg, Zemlinsky, and Schraker, amongst others, uh, admired Brahms, admired Wagner, loved them both did not wish to take sides because they felt that they were both great composers. They wished to find a synthesis for the antithetical viewpoints of both of these composers. So let's start with a short piece by Franz Schraker, which we can, which is here being played by members of the Baltimore Symphony, and we can put that on. I'll talk a little bit over it if that's possible. Uh, this is a piece called Intermezzo. Uh, it was written in 1901 as a part of the Schrader's graduation uh, from the
No, that beautiful piece uh, had a long and successful run in Schreker's time, as did Schreker. Schreker was so successful, he was compared to this man, Richard Strauss, who, along with Richard Wagner, were considered the two giants of their time, particularly as, a, as a regarded theater music or opera or music drama uh, by whatever title uh, you may know it or prefer to use it. Schreker was said to be the, uh, Schreker uh, enjoyed this great success. Uh, interestingly enough, Arnold Schoenberg said that Alexander Zemlinsky, in his mind, was the most, uh, was the greatest the theatrical composer of their time. So Schreker and Zemlinsky were competitors to some degree. This man, Richard Strauss, was beyond competition. His great success had turned him into an international character very early on. And of course, he was not banned by the Nazis as he was not Jewish. And second of all, um, they had a certain interest in, uh, in having a good relationship with him. Nevertheless, uh, Strauss and the Nazis had a falling out. He was allowed, of course, to continue his quiet life as he was already in his 80s. And though it is an temp a tempestuous relationship, uh, Strauss was the other potentate shall we say, not like, like Mahler, not in that he had a position of, of power as a conductor, but because he was so important that his music was influential. And so Strauss and Zemlinsky will both also uh, owe a great deal of their inspiration to him as well. Now, there's another inspiration, particularly to Alexander Zemlinsky, but also to Franz Schrecker, and here she is. That is Alma Schindler, the young woman who, uh, growing up in Vienna, seemed to have some personal magic that attracted not just men to her, but geniuses to her. Now, she became later known as Alma Mahler. I'll show you another picture, the next one. Uh, here she is rather dressed up, um, looking rather like a Gustav Klimt painting. And of course, the irony is that uh, we know from Alma's diaries that the first man who kissed her was Gustav Klimt. The first man to whom she admitted being in love with was Alexander Zemlinsky and he with her. And he was heartbroken, uh, traumatized really, when she abruptly left him and chose to move on to Gustav Mahler. Now, uh, the reason that the Seyungfrau, this is the, the Mermaid, that which we play for you, has such a poignant personal story is that it is actually all about Zemlinsky's broken heart after Alma left him. Now, Alma was and is a composer in her own right, and her music deserves to be played and scrutinized and um, really put in a perspective. Uh, I, I will not make a personal judgment and then say that it, she is not a great composer. I will say it's a, it, the music that I have conducted, I have enjoyed. So she should be viewed in two roles, really. Her role as an enormous uh, uh, inspiration, uh, a, 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 a sort of femme fatale of her time. Um, after Mahler was her husband, um, she did have a relationship with Walter Gropius, which also broke Mahler's heart, uh, she then married Gropius. Uh, after divorcing him, she married Franz Werfel. Um, uh, she and Franz Schrecker also spent some time together, it is said. Um, so half of her biography is that of a woman who was in the midst of a group of geniuses. And of course, she was the center of attention. But another part of her story has to be looked at as a, as a composer, and that's a separate subject. But she is so important to this whole group that I decided to include her. Now, we can skip over the next. Uh, this is the Zeyukfrau, which, of course, was written in the wake of Zemlinsky's relationship with her. Now, the next picture is considerably less um, fetching. Um, it is the sister of Alexander Zemlinsky who was the first wife of Arnold Schoenberg. And this is a sketch that was made by Schoenberg who loved, uh, who loved art and was a great 
uh, well, was certainly a great aficionado, and he, if, if nothing else, he was a very avid artist. Um, the story ended badly uh, because she uh, became romantically involved with a young artist named Kessel, and when that was discovered, A, Arnold Schoenberg, uh, understandably upset, um, uh, chose to get out of the marriage, and Mr. Gerstel committed suicide. So uh, these are the these are the times that these in, in which these composers and compositions were written. It's a very very interesting time historically. But let's get now to the uh, to the essence of what I want to tell you. And we'll put this slide away for a moment if we can, because these are pictures of Franz Schreger much later, which we'll come back to. Uh, because I'd like to concentrate with you on uh, uh, what recovered voices is really all about. Why has it been so difficult to re uh, to revive these works and make them a part of our concert going life as if we were going to concerts of Mozart, Beethoven, Brahms, Debussy, uh, Stravinsky, Bartok, or anybody else. Uh, First, let me say that there are prejudices against a lot of this music. And these prejudices, I think, are a company, a certain degree of intellectual laziness, um, where cliches substitute for true curiosity and for real knowledge. Um, I'm going to say that very often people say, well, why do you do this music? I mean, first of all, why have I never heard of it? Well, I was 40 years old before I actually heard any of it or realized what was there. Now, I started studying music when I was 11. I have, since that time, lived music, eaten music, drank music, dreamed music, every day of my life, and still do. If I were able to get from the age of 11 to age 40 and really have known nothing as a practice, practicing musician uh, and somebody with a, a great deal of curiosity, it's not surprising that most people, may probably most of you, have never heard their names or ever heard their music. So first of all, do not hold yourself responsible for the fact that you do not know their names or their music. Um, responsibility should be assigned where it belongs, with the Nazi regime, because it was their purpose to stifle the Jewish voice. And in so doing, along with their massive genocide, they tried everything to suppress composers, artists, writers, uh, not to mention professors, scientists, and many others. So. Um, they were partially successful, uh, cruelly successful in how they ruined people's lives. With time, it been less that success has not lasted so much in the arts and some of the sciences. Um, many emigrated, many, uh, many, many Jewish artists, professors, anybody who could emigrate it, and the brain drain in the Germanic speaking countries caused by the Nazi uh, suppression, turned out to be the brain gain, particularly of the United States, but also of, uh, of England, uh, the, at the time Palestine, now the state of Israel, but any place that these highly qualified and the, the, the Jewish uh, part of the population disproportionately uh, uh, important in their cultural, scientific, medical, uh, literary contributions. And so we've, we have benefited here in the United States from that emigration. Um, but strangely enough, the one part that has lagged behind is the actual performance of classical music by a lot of these composers. Uh, and it still is subject to uh, resistance and obstacles. So what are, some, what are some of the resistance, what are some of the obstacles that I have encountered almost consistently 
I say, you really ought to listen to the music of Alexander Zemlinsky, Franz Schrinker, of Victor Ullmann, of Walter Braunfels. Um, and somebody said, well, why should I listen to it? I said, well, if you love classical music, this is a great part of classical music uh, history. And it's beautiful music. There's a lot of it. There's thousands of pieces. So um, all you would have to find are 10 pieces or 15 pieces or even 20 pieces that would make it worth your while. Um, and I'm not proposing that every piece by every composer that was suppressed is uh, the musical equivalent of the Mona Lisa uh, or is Dante's Divine Comedy. But I am saying there's a lot of beautiful music there and certainly um, enough to keep any of you busy, just as it keeps me busy um, at any time that I'm not spending with those composers who are, more, who are more famous, more successful, and who were never suppressed during the Nazi regime. So the first thing, uh, the first, uh, I would say, cliche that I encounter is there are no lost masterpieces. If, 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 if it's not there, it means it wasn't very good in the first place. Of course, this, uh, this view is, abs is actually absurd when you, when you investigate that. We know that every war, every conflict has, re uh, has resulted in enormous destruction, first and foremost of human life, sometimes animal life, certainly culture, architecture, cities have been destroyed, cultures have been destroyed. Does a person saying there are no lost masterpieces mean, for instance, that there was nothing in pre-Columbian South America or Central America that we would consider an artistic masterpiece today if we had it? That the conquistadores with a very fine cultured uh, orientation came and destroyed or melted down gold for their um, for their reward for their genocide of South America that they only selected bad art and threw it out. Uh, that's what one would be saying about the Nazi regime. The Nazi regime was rejecting art, largely of Jewish composers, but not only Jewish composers, anybody that they didn't like, they were not being selective. They didn't even know that much about music. Um, they did not even, they were not qualified to make that judgment. And yet they banned, suppressed anyway. So to make that equivalency, does that mean that every piece of music that did not survive or has not been properly given its due after the war because the Nazis suppressed it was because people of great authority and knowledge during the Nazi regime were actually decided this is not good music, we're not going to listen to it. This is good music, we're going to listen. We know none of that happened. And to say that there are no lost masterpieces would say um, there is nothing that was to be found in any civilization anywhere, uh, ancient Chinese dynasties, the Persian Empire, um, the Greek Empire, um, Europe in the Dark Ages, to assume that there are no lost masterpieces is actually Absurd. So I reject it. So somebody says there are no lost masterpieces. Therefore, I don't need to bother familiarizing them with my with this music. I'm, I'm going to reject it. Um, a corollary to that is, if I don't know it, it can't be very good. Well, this is has its own equivalent in a in a third cliche that I hear, um, which is really a byproduct of our highly commercial society. It's a belief in, uh, I guess, in economics and to some degree in economic theory, uh, the best product will always float to the top because it's just simply better than other products, which by competition will be eliminated. Now, um, is there some truth in that? Yes, but not when applied uh, uncritically. And of course, we also now know that there is a I don't know what to call it, an art, a science, or at least a discipline, which is called uh, marketing. And we know that a bad product, well marketed, may float to the top better than a good product, which is poorly marketed. So right there, there are exceptions to, the, to that supposed rule. 
But um, I think that none of that applies when talking about classical music, about it floating to the top. Yes, the great works of Beethoven, Mozart, Haydn, Bach floated to the top a long time ago. Although please do not forget that the, that the works of Johann Sebastian Bach and particularly the Matthew Passion, which I happen to be conducting in the coming weeks, was not played for an entire century because it was not known. And if it had not been for Felix Mendelssohn, who, by the way, was also, whose music was also suppressed, uh, of course, posthumously by the Nazis, if it hadn't been for him reviving it, it may have been a lot longer before it became known and before Bach would have been recognized for his uh, full scope of his genius. So the fact that some of this music has not been played for at least 75 years, some of it for 80 years, should not discourage anybody from being uh, curious enough or brave enough to realize that it should, should be done. But the fact is that it's not good. If I don't know it, therefore it's not good, which is of course a sort of uh, egocentric viewpoint. I don't know it, therefore it's not worth anything. Um, or the idea that in our society, only the best music has become the most famous. Well, we simply don't know that is true. We know that that is not true. And for instance, if you even take popular composers, let's say somebody like Antonin Dvorak, who everybody says, oh, Dvorak, yes, the New World Symphony. Some might say, oh, yes, the uh, the cello concerto or others might say, well, yes, the Slavonic Passes. Well, what about all of his tone poems? What about his extraordinary choral works, which, yes, they're known by music lovers, they're known by certain persons, but they're not as famous, as popular as the, the works I cited. And that is another indication that we actually don't really live fully, um, we don't really experience all of these things fully. Now, I'd like to ask ourselves, um, the question is to, you know, why should we explore this music? Why should we perform it? Why should we be listening? I think it's important, uh, but that's not a reason to do it. That's not a reason for you to take an interest, but I think it should be important to you. And this is why. I think there are three areas of uh, importance here. And there is a, a moral issue. Uh, there's a, a, a historic issue and there is an artistic issue. And with all those, and I will be looking forward and giving you a chance to uh, ask questions and we will do a QA and a when, when I'm done speaking. So uh, uh, hold on to any questions you may have and please share them uh, as I think you can. What are the moral reasons? Well, the first moral reason for me is uh, when you see or are exposed to an injustice, if you can undo that injustice, you should. Now, I have that moral or ethical upbringing simply because my parents brought us, or five children, they brought us up with that idea. And so uh, that's a, uh, that is to me a obligation as a citizen, as a human being. Now, we can't undo all injustice, unfortunately. We know that. And we cannot re-give the lives back to these composers who either lost them literally in concentration camps or whose lives were uprooted um, through forced or uh, at least preferable emigration, who lost the natural audience and public and forum where their works would have been played, disseminated, and would have also given birth to progeny in terms of their own influence. We can't give any of that back to the composers who suffered, but we can do the one thing that would be more meaningful to them than anything else, and that is to play their music, to become uh, familiar with it. So I propose that first moral reason as a very important reason. In its way, also, we are performing an act of remembrance, which is very important, and it is especially important now that uh, we are getting to a point where almost all of the people who directly experienced the Holocaust, the Nazi genocide, are no longer with us. And unfortunately, uh, as, you, as you all know, we are hearing, we, we hear abominable ideas like the Holocaust 
is a myth. It was fake news. It never took place. So it's now more important than ever before, these acts of remembrance. And I propose an act of remembrance that has never been uh, fully realized is the act of remembrance of composers whose music was suppressed and whose lives were uh, negatively uh, impacted. Um, we've never really done that. And I think we have an opportunity to, to do that. And of course, I think that that's very important. Second reason, history. The history of the 20th century, of 20th century classical music was written, has been written, and continues to be written with the omission of all of the composers who fall into this category. Now, some of them may get a line or two, their names may be mentioned, but very few of them are studied in depth. And most of all, the entire period uh, between, let's say, anywhere from 1900, 1910, right up until 1933, was a far more dynamic period of artistic viewpoints uh, than we realized. Now, I went through uh, my education, including the Juilliard School, where we all took music history. I never heard mention of any of these composers with whom I have now become, and that's not just me. I think that that is largely true still in a lot of places. Most histories of music barely mention or talk in depth about most of these composers. So a historian has the obligation to revisit any period of any period of history when new information is available and to reassess, recontextualize uh, whatever happens. So is this important? Yes. So a historian should uh, look again at uh, ancient Chinese dynasties when new information is available to uh, ancient Greece, to the Persian dynasties, uh, to the American Civil War, to pre-Columbian uh, Central and South America, um, e e anything, even to the lives of presidents, the lives of presidential candidates who were not elected, even to elections. 2000 election, if you wish. Any of these stories where there's no information that wasn't out there need to be revisited. And so it is with classical music. We need to have this history present. Those names need to be present. We need to know who they were. You are free to dislike their music afterwards. I, I suggest that you won't dislike it all. But you're free to dislike it. But I say not before you know it. And you can't know something if you've not heard it, A, and you can't even hear it if you don't even know their names. So a moral reason, a historical reason. And the third reason, and it's of course the most important reason, is the artistic reason. The fact is that a lot of very, very good music has been uh, erased, canceled was a term that wasn't around that long ago, but now it's uh, very present in our lives and in our awareness, a lot of this music was canceled uh, unjustifiably, unjustly. And in order for us to really fully enjoy and appreciate the richness of the uh, classical music repertory, we deserve to have it known and available to us. We know the reasons it, were re it was rejected and repressed had nothing to do with its intrinsic quality. It had to do largely with the genocidal uh, policies, uh, if you can dignify them with that name, the cruelty, the criminality of the Nazi regime, uh, millions of lives that were lost uh, through their aggression and we know the music did not disappear because it hadn't floated to the top because it wasn't that good or for any other reason. It is a victim of a tyrannical regime. It is a victim of war. It is a victim of genocide. And um, in this regard, the Nazis were successful in a part of their program which was to stifle the Jewish voice. 
They didn't succeed fully, but they did still manage to enjoy a certain part of the victory. And I would suggest that in 2022, which is now over 75 years after the end of the war, to say that that victory was partially successful. And it's, I think, important to meditate on the fact that between 1933 and 1945, 12 short years, damage has been done that ha it has cost at least 75 years in order to undo some of it. Just another lesson, uh, and we are all experiencing it firsthand now uh, in the Ukraine, that war, cruelty, destruction is unfortunately easy for those who perpetrate it. And reconstruction, rebirth, bringing things back to life, bringing them back into civilization, is very, very, very difficult. And so, sadly, in its way, the Nazi regime uh, or its memory is still enjoying that posthumous victory. I, for one, cannot accept that and will, will have been doing as much as I can and will be continuing to do as much as I can as long as I am alive to undo that posthumous victory and turn it into a defeat. So I'm going to stop talking now. I've talked a lot. Uh, I didn't show you all my pictures. Um, and I think I'll do that quickly while you think of your questions. I'll just, uh, I, I know that was supposed to be, it's always entertaining to see the pictures. Let's see what I can come up with there. And then please, I'm waiting for all of your questions. <laughs> this is Franz Schreker much later in his life with his wife, Maria. Franz Schreker is one of the few composers who actually died simply from the stress that was put on him by the Nazis. Um, his, his fortune was that he died in 1934, and so he did not live long enough to see um, the full uh, cruelty suppression, uh, including the concentration camps. But he was fired from his position, the highest position in German, the German classical music world, as uh, director of the Hochschule in Berlin, the conservatory. Uh, and he was removed for, def for defending Jewish, other Jewish composers in, and, and musicians, including people like Arnold Schoenberg and Oliver Klemperer. He was fired, he was demoted to another academy, and then he was fired from that academy after the Nazis took power in 1933. Uh, they then denied him his pension. And he was so upset because he had no form of income, um, he went back to Pfeiffer. His wife begged him not to. She said, please don't go near them. Come with me. We're going to get out of Europe. He went back anyway. He had a stroke and in March of 1934 died, still a relatively young man in his 50s. His wife left with their daughter, went to Buenos Aires, returned after the war, went through all of the music shops that she could in Berlin and said she could not find one piece of music published by her husband, despite the fact that of all the composers that I have grouped together, he is perhaps the one who had the most success and notoriety during his life, as I said, being compared to both Richard Strauss and Richard Wagner. A great irony that showed it did not help to be highly successful or highly or, or well-known. It was no guarantee against the horrors that took place. So there's Franz Schreger with his wife, Maria Schreger, a singer. Now the next, uh, next photo, there he is again, getting closer to uh, his last years in 1930. Excuse me, Mr. Conlon, if I could just interject uh, very briefly. If you have a question, if anyone has a question, you can put it into the chat box and we'll uh, pose it from there. Uh, just uh, click on the thing that says chat and the chat box will appear. Thank you, John. Uh, this is Vienna 1900, which is, of course, the great scene for all of these composers. Uh, uh, Brahms, of course, uh, just passed away, but Gustav Mahler is there. 
Richard Strauss is a important figure there. Um, the young Schoenberg, the young Zemlinsky, the young Schraker are growing up there. Uh, a music, the musical capital, if not the only capital in the musical world. That was Vienna 1900. Here's another nice shot of that and another one. Very romantic. It's going to turn into this. This is Berlin of 1933, the uh, right after the accession to power of Hitler and the Nazis, uh, which of course is a catastrophic event, even from its beginning for some of our composers. Pass on to the next one. Franz Schrager looked like that in 1912. You saw what he looked like in 1930. It wasn't the same. Now we go on to the next here is Berlin in 1934, the year of Schrager's death. Now also in 1934, Alexander Zemlinsky, who had been uh, who had been employed by the Kroll Opera in Berlin, left Berlin because all Jewish mus musicians were being persecuted, their music banned. He returned to his native Vienna, uh, stayed there for 19 for four years. At the time of the Anschluss, when the when the Germans annexed uh, uh, the Sudetenland, and when they came to Vienna, he, having seen Berlin, left immediately, uh, left with his wife and all the belongings that he could find, went to New York City, lived on the west side of Manhattan on his arrival, pretty much isolated and ignored by uh, everybody. He, in the time he was there, uh, before his death in 1942, one piece of his was performed once, a radio broadcast of his Sinfonietta conducted by Dmitry Metropolis with the New York Philharmonic on national radio. He was too ill to attend. His wife lived until 19... Uh, sorry about that. Uh, not quite sure what that is. Uh, his wife lived until approximately... 1990 in uh, in New York, I could now slip my wrists that as a student in Juilliard in the early 70s that I didn't know enough about Zielinski to go and find her and to pick her brains, which I of course would have done. So our next uh, our next slide. Uh, this is the piece that I will conduct next. September, and since we're running a little short of time now, I'm not sure I'm going to play it for you, but I'm in, going to encourage you to go on YouTube. Uh, you can find it, that recording, which was uh, made by me, James Conlon. Uh, uh, Prelude to a Drama is actually uh, uh, a piece that was written as an overture to an opera. The opera has a complicated name. It's called Die Gezeichneten. That means, it's a hard word to translate out of German, it means those who have been marked. It's also sometimes translated as the stigmatized. Um, it's those who have been drawn. Complicated title uh, of an exquisite opera. Uh, but during the war, First World War, Schrecker could not get a production because of the war. But the Vienna Philharmonic and Felix Weingartner invited him to write a commission, a work for the orchestra. And so he expanded the overture into a symphonic work. It's now called Prelude to a Drama. Uh, you may find it on the, uh, on the YouTube as Vorspiel zu einem Drama. Don't be confused by that. Uh, but if you simply put, put Prelude to a Drama, James Conlon, Franz Schrecker, you can find my recording, but you can also find other recordings. That work, by the way, became the first opera of Schrager's 13 operas to be produced in America on stage. And I conducted it in 2011 in LA. That means it took a hundred years for that or any other opera by Schrager to arrive onto our stages. Highly recommend it to that you take an interest in that. So we'll, go, we'll move on to our next slide. Uh, this is me or advertising myself. I, I'm not really, I don't make any money from this, but I have made a TED Talk. Um, it lasts about 10 minutes and it's called Resurrecting Forbidden Music. And it's the same subject that we're discussing, but I had a very different type of discuss, discussion. 
coming from a separate uh, viewpoint, starting with most amazingly the effect that these composers have had on our movie music coming from Hollywood and our very own John Williams, moving through other composers who are not mentioned, who I haven't mentioned tonight, but I do recommend it. It's uh, short and it is a good introduction. Uh, I think we've seen this and we'll certainly hopefully see this again. Mm -hmm. This I would like you to take special note, and even if you have a chance and you can jot this down. The Orel Foundation is a website, and all you have to do is put in orelfoundation.org. I uh, created this website uh, about 16 or 17 years ago uh, because as I started uh, uh, collecting a lot of performances of this music around America with the various symphony orchestras, in educational uh, institutions, people inevitably, uh, well, I, uh, I would like to say that many people reacted not just enthusiastically about their music, but were really very moved uh, and then said, I can't believe we don't know this. How can I find out about this? And I said, well, unfortunately, there are not a lot of places I can send you. There's very little literature on the subject, very little written in English. There is, if anything, a good deal of literature written in German because the Germans of today are the one people who have taken this subject very seriously and have in their way tried to uh, make reparations for it. So I determined to make a website, which I did, and it's called the Orel Foundation, uh, org. And you can just simply put that in there. And if you can't remember Orel, you can just put James Conlon Orel, and I think you'll find your way to it as well. It's not a foundation that gives money or, or a foundation that needs money, actually. But it, the, we, we gave it a, a name, a misnomer. We're, we're going to change that one of these days soon. But the whole purpose of this is as a resource material. And I can say um, with a certain amount of, I think, accuracy and a little bit of immodesty, maybe, I think now probably it's one of the leading websites to be visited in the world on this subject. We have the biographies of 25 composers plus uh, all of their works, and then uh, a large volume of articles written about all aspects of the subject that we have just been discussing. Uh, much more for you to retain any one visit. Uh, I actually don't know everything that's on that. So, so, I mean, I, I, we, we uh, hired musicologists and biographers to write biographies of all the composers, but it's certainly worth it as a reference point we only have about two dozen composers, but we are in the process of expanding that now, and very soon it will be out there uh, for you to enjoy. Um, I think I've said everything that I should be say. I could talk forever, I won't. Uh, I'm now very happy to receive your, uh, your questions, and I have as long as you do, let's put it that way. <laughs> I don't see any questions at the chat at this point. Um, I will just ask you one uh, that, that uh, came to my mind. Um, in in uh, becoming familiar with these composers, did you have to do a lot of uh, searching on your own, or, or were they kind of hiding in, in plain sight? Uh, was there any kind of detective work you had to do in order to, to find these works? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. And the uh, and please don't be shy if anything comes into your mind to anybody. Thank you, John, for asking that question. Um, amazingly enough, most of the music exists in is published or is available. Most of it, not all of it. And what I felt was my most useful function in all of this was to perform. Because music written on a piece of paper or published or sitting in the office of a publishing company is actually not alive. Music needs to be heard, needs to be played. Musicians need to play it. A public needs to listen to it for it to have that magic that it does. So as long as it's not played, it's in my, in, to my degree, in my way of thinking neglected. I have not been a researcher, a person who goes out and discovers, but what I have been is a little bit of a magnet because people have come to me and said, 
I'd like you to be aware of this person, that person, another person who wrote this kind of music. And they'll even sometimes have um, recordings of that music, or at least they will be able to have a, uh, copies of the music. So I have been a magnet. I hope I've been an inspiration to some degree to do this. I myself have not done personal research. Now, there is a man whose name is Ongaro, who is Italian, who has, um, who has a mission as well. And our missions are not identical, but if you can imagine a Venn diagram, there's an area where we overlap. Uh, Mr. Ongaro's purpose is to find absolutely any uh, art music that was destroyed uh, uh, or hidden away or it's gotten lost during the Holocaust. Now, I am specifically focused on classical composers because that's my discipline and that's my area of belief. But Mr. Ongaro does a very important part. And some of those, of course, are the same, same issue. And by the way, I should also mention that I'm not suggesting that only in Nazi Germany has music been destroyed, composers been, uh, been persecuted. And when it comes to Jewish composers, uh, unfortunately, there is an enormous amount of music that most likely has been destroyed by under the Stalinist regime. Uh, it's just as the victims of Stalinism are countless. We know more about general about statistics of the German genocide because the Germans kept them. The Russians just had people disappear. So yes, there's a lot of music out there. We're uh, a little bit over time, but I will uh, take one more question. Um, what is the reaction of orchestra members when they're presented with this music? I would say overwhelmingly positive, uh, sometimes even to the point of amazement. I know that here in Baltimore on my first concert, I performed the Zee Jungfrau, and I think it was very, very enthusiastic on the stage. It's been my experience uh, for a majority of those experiences. Now, naturally, everybody has their opinions, and everyone's free to say, I don't like that. That's not, not for me, and that's fine. And I'm fine with that, as long as people have had a chance to become familiar with it, to play it, to hear it, and to, uh, and if judgments must be made, so be it. But after you actually have heard the piece of music, and maybe even more than once, because all music is a little bit unfamiliar the first time you hear it. Well, I'd like to thank you, Mr. Conlon, for uh, spending this time with us. I certainly learned a lot, and I am definitely hoping to be in the audience uh, when you play the Schrecker piece uh, this, this fall. Um, we're going to drop an evaluation link into the uh, chat box, um, and we'd like you to go ahead and open that in your browser windows. So you, you can complete it while this experience is uh, fresh. We'd really love to have your feedback. Uh, We'd like you to visit our website at icjs.org to subscribe to our email list, learn about upcoming programs, and to donate. ICJS is non-sectarian and independent, unaffiliated with any academic or religious organization. We're supported by people like you, so while we strive to make all of our programming available at no cost, we ask for your support in making our work possible. And if you're not already receiving our email newsletter, we invite you to sign up to learn all about our upcoming programs. Uh, so thank you for joining us. We're going to send a, a follow-up email uh, to everyone who uh, registered for this, uh, this session uh, with some of the links that uh, Mr. Conlon mentioned and uh, a video if you want to uh, review uh, any of uh, what we went over tonight. So thank you very much for joining us and good night.